heavy uh, yesterday. That was uh, fun for some, anyway. <laughs> uh, so that was good. Actually, one way or the other, either with Grandma or with Granddad, I think everybody got to do something uh, yesterday, so that's a good thing. And Janice and I got to reintroduce ourselves uh, this morning at uh, breakfast time. So um, the... Uh, it probably you see the upcoming events in your bulletin, so uh, everything is kind of getting closer to back to normal for those meetings, our Wednesday night uh, for youth time and for the Bible study uh, in James, uh, also Thursday the women's Bible study. Um, probably um, what I have to announce, I suppose, uh, was after we wrote this bulletin on Thursday, and that's that our first uh, Sunday that we'll be offering Sunday morning Bible study time for uh, children, youth, and adults will be July the 12th. And so that's just another step, uh, and we'll move back. So if you get here at, I don't know, 9.45 or 10, you'll be in time for the uh, Bible study time anyway. Uh, so we'll move back to what we had as our original schedule, 9.45 for our Sunday school time, 11 o'clock for our worship time, and um, uh, looking forward to that uh, little change, I guess we'll say, as well. So um, seems like there's a couple of other things floating around in my head, but that was the most important that came from our church council meeting last week. Also, I'm looking around the room, and uh, some are here and some aren't, uh, but I want to just make sure I say thank you uh, to folks that helped at Hesperus Camp this last week. Uh, Tom and uh, Alexander, doesn't that feel like that was three weeks ago? But anyway, <laughs> Wednesday, I think it was last Wednesday, and several others helped set up the tent uh, up there. And um, uh, Julie and her children uh, from about Thursday on, I think, camped out at the camp, and they've been helping uh, do an event there uh, a uh, local um, uh, family uh, reunion that was uh, taking place uh, Friday, Saturday, and this morning, I believe. So I think I got that right. Uh, so anyway, um, and also the camp is uh, in pretty good order and uh, pretty much on schedule and uh, is working out some things for both children's and youth camp coming in July, uh, women's retreat in August. So several things are going to be on a little different schedule than maybe we had a full year ago, but uh, many things are back on track, so that's a good thing. Anything else I need to be announcing for us this morning? Okay, um, goody. We'll have our, uh, our uh, scripture reading and prayer next, and then missionary moment. Thank you. Sorry. Not to repeat myself, but good morning. Um, we're going to look in our scripture reading at Psalm 33 today. And we've talked a number of times, Wednesday night and here as well, how many of the Psalms have something called a superscription, and that's at the beginning of the psalm when it will say Psalm of David or something like that. Um, and many of the ones related to the Psalms of David are integral to what happens in David's life. In fact, you can trace that psalm directly to, in many cases, First and Second Samuel, um, sometimes Kings, but it's directly related to what was going on in David's life. This is not one of those psalms. There are only four psalms in all of the first book of the Psalter that do not have a superscript. This is one of them. But the conjecture is this was a song to call people to worship sung by a, the Levitical choir. And you'll probably get that in these first few verses. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song. 
Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. Father, in just these five verses, you tell us to come with joy. You tell us to raise our voices, Father, to make a joyful noise, Father, in your name. Father, we do that today, and and we praise you, Father, for the ability to do so. And we also understand, Father, that you are the one who controls all life events. You control what's happening today, Father, and it will be for your glory and your honor at some point. We praise these things and, and ask for your guidance in your name. Amen. Doug and Dana Roberts are two missionaries from the North Henry Baptist Church in Stockbridge, Georgia. They have been sent to a group of people in central Mexico. These people are called the Nuwa, N-U-H-U-A. They are descended directly from the Aztecs. Due to my world history education, I was under the impression that Hernando Cortez came in and wiped out all the Aztecs, destroyed the empire, and then the smallpox that he brought with him wiped out everybody else. But apparently, there are now 1.7 million descendants who still speak Aztec and follow that. I did not know that. Uh, and due to migrant workers coming in and out of the country, they've established three new huttle, they call them, new huttle communities in Houston, New York City, and L.A., because most of our missionaries through the cooperative program in Mexico speak Spanish, there are no churches and no Christian witnesses for the Nuwa people. And I got to thinking about that because what I was told, Cortez brought in the Roman Catholic religion from Spain and uh, used it to control the people. So uh, apparently it didn't stick because right now there's, there's no Christianity and no Christian churches at all down there. Um, Doug and Dana are considered pioneers and have now established one church among them and recently baptized four new believers. Outside of that, I could find no other information on where Doug and Dana, what the name of their church is, where they're at, or anything. So they all the only thing, they've been in the Dominican Republic. So this is a recent assignment. Um, and as you know, I like to digress a little bit, especially when I can't find filler. <laughs> um, the English language has absorbed several new huttle, new huttle Aztec words. The most famous and delicious is Mike chocolate, 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 chocolate. Um, the rest, the other words that I didn't know were avocado, tomato, coyote, peyote, and chile. So I guess if my friend Jerry Day were here, he'd say, who cares? <laughs> That's what he always says to me when I get off base. Anyway, let's pray for Doug and Dana. Heavenly Father, I pray that Doug and Dana will continue to lead many lost people in central Mexico to faith in Christ. We also pray that you will call many more missionaries in this part of Mexico so that all of the Nuwa people can hear the gospel. In your son's holy name, amen. Hey, D, that was, we're really rigged. Sorry about that, Tom. Let's sing something. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus if you'll stand with us. That'd be great. If you can't, sing right where you are. I will too in your hymnal.
Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood. Just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing blood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Yes, it is sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him all and all. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that he is with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Amen. Jesus is all the world to me. It's 475 in your hymnal. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him I would fall. When I am sad to him I go, no other one can cheer me so. is all the world to me, my friend, this child's soul. I go to him for blessings and he gives them all and all. He sends the sunshine and the rain. He sends the harvest golden grain. Sunshine and rain, harvest of rain, he's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me, and true to him I'll be. Oh, how could I this friend deny when he's so true to me? Is o'er me day and night. Follow 
song this morning is When I Look Into Your Holiness, 484 in your hymnal. We'll do the chorus a second time after we've sung it all. before you, Father, we continue to recognize all things come from you, Father. So what we give back today is merely a, a pittance of what you've given us, what you've blessed us with. I pray, Father, you continue to bless us as we take an offering in your name, in the name of your son. Amen.
don't usually do this, but hey, every now and then you got to do something different, right? And um, the song's been uh, singing around in my head all week, and so it's got to come out of my lips. But I want you to sing it along with me, and uh, you'll feel free to leave. Uh, and the uh, worship team didn't prepare this, so that's all right. But I made sure I had the words in front of me here so I don't get totally messed up. Uh, and you know the song well. It's praise the name of Jesus, praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock, he's my fortress, he's my deliverer, rock, fortress, deliverer. Uh, in him will I trust, praise the name of Jesus. Let's just do that a cappella here for a second and uh, see if I can start in about the right place about a three. Yep, right there. Praise the name of Jesus, praise the name of of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer, and him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. Thank you. Man, that sounded so good. I started to choke up, and I thought, wait a minute, I'm trying to lead this thing. So, I'm sure it's not hay dust. Uh, I think it was emotion. I don't know about you guys. Uh, so, I've, uh, I've started, and I'm going to kind of here and there for a few weeks, an idea that I tried to use as the follow-up idea when we were talking about for such a time as this, uh, because we, you and I, are on a pilgrimage. And so, kind of the next step in this, uh, in this uh, series E is... Uh, this idea of the pilgrimage that you and, and I are on with our Lord. And, um, and so today, uh, behave with love. And you'll be looking at Romans chapter 12, um, uh, essentially verses 9 through 21. Uh, but I, I don't know, uh, there, are, there are things in my childhood that I can remember, um, and uh, some maybe that I'd like to forget. But uh, one of those uh, was... Uh, Somebody would say uh, about in this tone of voice, if I can get it right, you boys behave. And um, honestly, I don't remember my parents ever actually saying it just that way uh, because they we already knew <laughs> what would happen if we didn't. And uh, and I'd like to tell you that we were angelic and um, we never got into trouble. Well, I believe that the way, the way I heard that you boys behave were all of those relatives from our extended family uh, other persons that we met at church, <laughs> and uh, other social uh, situations, grocery store or whatever. We didn't have a Walmart back in those days. But anyway, other essential businesses. Anyway, um, and uh, my, but my mother, uh, a, uh, a colloquialism, I guess I'll say, that I remember about my mother is she would say, straighten up and fly right. Did you ever hear that? I mean, maybe you've said that. And there might be uh, multiple ways of saying that. So today we're talking about behaving, and specifically, God is telling us to behave with love. Now, uh, Paul wrote this epistle to uh, Christians in Rome probably in the fall of A.D. 57. Uh, it's interesting that there are, there are some of the letters and some of the uh, books of the Bible. We're, we're very approximate. We, it's, it might be... Uh, might be decades that we're approximating about when this was written, but there are several things that help us know about when this book was written. Um, it's, it's written from Corinth. It's on his third missionary journey. And because of the, the, uh, the season of uh, uh, ship travel, uh, there were certain times of the year that they couldn't be doing that. So it's, it, we're able to narrow that down a little bit. But our text begins after Paul emphasizes serving God with spiritual gifts earlier in chapter 12. So let's read it. It's um, Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. 
Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So, there's a gospel song that I tried to look up on the internet, and all I could find was stuff I didn't want to hear. Uh, (laughs) But anyway, it has some lyrics in it about a preacher standing at the pulpit one Sunday, and his message is, love, love, love. That's it. That's all. Because it's all about love. Now, like I say, some of those things that I found as I did my little internet search, they weren't about love. (laughs) They just used the words. And it was about something else, mostly about lust. But uh, as we look at the passage today, we'll consider uh, three B's. I'll try to get this right. Be loving, be there, be of the same mind. So as we look at be loving, the first thing that Paul addresses is he he says to hold or to have or to demonstrate unhypocritical love. He says, let love be without hypocrisy. It is easy uh, for us, you and me, to put on kind of a facade of either politeness or even maybe thoughtfulness or sensitivity when that's really not what's inside our heart. That's called hypocritical love. <laughs> um, and so he's saying, let, let what your face is saying be lined up with your heart. Uh, now, uh, for some of us, that still requires some change because maybe what's in our heart is not that loving or that thoughtful or that considerate of another. And so he gives us <coughs> more information here. He says to hate, that word abhor from the New King James Version, hate evil. And then he says, cling to good. But just a little observation. He does not say, uh, hate the evildoer or the evil people. He talks about evil it, itself, the action, the attitude. Then he says to be kindly affectionate, to have affection. Uh, the word, uh, the Greek word is uh, philostorgos, uh, and it means with brotherly love. Uh, so here's how we live out Philostorgos. Uh, first, he says that we're diligent, we're fervent, we're serving. This is both our attitude and our action as we're living out our lives, ministering to others. He says that we're to be rejoicing in hope and steadfast in prayer. Our... Uh, Littlest granddaughter, uh, at mostly knows, we'll say it that way, mostly knows that whenever we assemble for a meal, that there's going to be prayer time, right? And uh, she may or may not hold hands with the person sitting near her, but mostly. Uh, but uh, she'll hold hands and bow her head. And uh, sometimes I've wondered if, I'm just speaking of that, I'm sure the rest of my grandchildren have never done this. I think maybe it's just a con job to get me to bow my head so she can reach for something. But anyway, um, but I but I know that uh, she is uh, kind of learning that process, right? Of we honor God by pausing before we eat. But but the reason I'm giving that kind of light uh, example is that that's not steadfast in prayer. It's a I think it's an an important and it's a nice ritual and and we want to acknowledge that God is our provider and that he's provided the meal and that's representative of all the rest of what he's provided around us. But steadfast in prayer is spending some time with him and it's mostly listening. Um, I think it's good for you and me to pour out our heart and for us to uh, uh, pray for things and circumstances and situations that are well beyond our control. But 
steadfast in prayer is listening to him. And um, uh, oh, and another thing, he says that we're to be meeting physical needs of brothers, sisters, strangers. Uh, the quote from the New King James Version is given to hospitality. And hospitality means, the word for it means, love of strangers. Now, there's more than uh, one plane for our love. We are to love God. We are to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, and you're to love your neighbor as yourself. Um, if you uh, were to flip over to uh, Romans 13, uh, verses 8 through 10, it says, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. If there is any other commandment, all are summed up in, in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Oh, and then there's this other thing. We're to love our enemy. Huh? <laughs> yeah. I'm just reading the book. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Jesus' words from Luke's account of the Sermon on the Mount at uh, Luke chapter 6, verses 27 and 28, uh, Jesus said, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. Jesus says this is how you love your enemy, you bless them, you pray for them. Now your goal in blessing your enemy is to not... Well, let, let, me, let me get my grammar correctly. Your goal is not to heap coals of fire on their head. It's not to goad them into changing their ways. It's not to get better treatment for yourself. Really, it's to be obedient to your Savior and Lord of all your life. Your prayer life for your enemy is to ask God, and that's steadfast in prayer, to ask God to bless them, to prosper them in family relations, in social interactions, financially, in personal health. Uh, one man uh, told me that uh, God in instructed us to pray for our national leaders. And so we pray for our president. And so, uh, but that at that time, there was a president in office that he had not uh, voted for. You know where I'm going with that? And so he said, I pray for him. I pray that his reign may be short upon this earth. I'm just asking you, is that praying for or against? Just saying. Then Jesus wraps up his admonition at verse 31 of the same passage. And he says, and just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. This is totally counter to human nature. We want to do to them <laughs> we want to do to them before they do to us yet the scripture is saying bless those who persecute you do good to those who hate you scripture would be a lot easier to handle if it would not require us to change every time we read it that's all i can say but there's more at verse uh, 17, repay no one evil for evil. And at verse 19, do not avenge yourselves. Then at verse 20, uh, these others are sort of defensive, I guess, but this is kind of moving on the offense. He says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. Um, that might be different than my friend's prayer request for his president. Uh, so so we had uh, be loving. Now we have be there. We should live our lives together. Rejoice with those who rejoice. I've got to say this because I know it, it uh, touches a, an alarm with Janice and she'd have to come up here and slap me. Uh, we're all in this together. Uh, so uh, uh, if there's nothing that's been uh, more overused in our world right now as an excuse for who knows what, uh, it's that. But anyway, but that but but now that I'm doing that, uh, we are to rejoice with those who rejoice and we're to weep with those who weep. Uh, you can't do this by only being associated with one another for one hour a week. 
or less yet when your association with your church family is only listening to the preacher together in this room. You and I must find opportunity to, to develop and provide community in our church family. There have been a few recent challenges to pulling this off with governmental orders, but it's still a priority. Just find a creative way to be there. Uh, the Bible calls us sheep, sheep of his pasture in Psalms. And Jesus refers to his followers as sheep. He says, my sheep in the Gospels. Now, um, most of you know that I have cattle. And so for a cattleman, that's probably offensive. <laughs> Since there were somebody uh, way back when we owned uh, about, well, a, a little bit of land that had uh, a lot of oak brush on it. And somebody said, have you considered running goats? And I said, no. <laughs> uh, I didn't give them the thoughtful answer. And they were also, because the, the next word was, and sheep, no. Uh, so, uh, so I had a very, uh, I have a bias. But, um, and uh, maybe this goes back to, uh, if you read our history in Colorado, I, I made a little note. I said there were cattle and sheep wars from way back in Colorado history. Well, that's sort of true, but it, weren't, it wasn't the cattle and the sheep that were fighting. <laughs> it was the owners of those animals. So, uh, but that's what they call them, cattle and sheep wars. Well, let's think about what, it's to be, what it is to be sheep for just a minute, uh, because sheep, even more than cattle, are gregarious. That means that they're more comfortable in a herd than they are separate or independent. Uh, they have this innate tendency to flock together. And I guess because God has called us that and because I've looked at how we're made and how we act together and separately, uh, I've found that uh, he's made you and me more comfortable in a herd than independent. Um, I guess I'll chase this rabbit just for a second. I had this plan when I went off to college that uh, uh, I was going to own land and be a hermit. And I met this girl, and it completely dashed the whole game plan. I thought, what would you like to do? Now, she will have a different perspective, and you can ask her later, because she believes that our entire 47 years have been whatever Clyde wants to do, that's what we do. So I'm just trying to defend her a little bit. She'll tell you that. <laughs> is that true? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> or is that okay, dear? Anyway, uh, so, um, but the point is that... Um, uh, I found that my hermitage idea had a few flaws in it. <laughs> and that uh, uh, loneliness can uh, really work on you. But anyway, uh, we need to flock together. God has made you and me more comfortable in a herd than independent. Um, that's part of what uh, has been hard in, this, in both the stay-at-home and the safer-at-home orders from our governor. Um, Satan, by the way, would like for you to be isolated, independent, all right, uh, so much so that you're alienated from others. Uh, Janice um, and I have observed uh, it over more than 45 years of living in Colorado. Even a church member, an active church member who comes from another place and comes to Durango, while they had a church home in their former place, they either seek none or they find none here. And they become isolated from a church family. And it causes this degree of isolation for them, even from their heavenly father. They find themselves in a place where they're more alienated from God because they're not associating with God's people. I cannot tell you. Some of you know, maybe, maybe I've said this to some of you. I'm going to tell you how many times Janice and I have said in visiting with someone, uh, especially that claims to be a Christ follower, uh, that you really need to find a church home. It could be ours, it could be another, but you need to be seeking for that and to find that. And for every time that we've said it, I'm going to guess about 10% have uh, taken us up on the admonition, something like that. And the rest have chosen... I'll say it that way, to be kind of without and, and kind of floating around, not knowing how they ought to relate even to their Heavenly Father because they're not relating on a regular basis to a church family. So 
I know that you can have a relationship with God without depending on others for that relationship. But you can't be a true follower of Jesus without coming to the conclusion that he has called you not only in, into individual relationship with him, but also with his common followers, your brothers and sisters in Christ, his church, this local body of Christ, committed to Christ, committed to one another. And then one other B, and that's B of the same mind. Uh, maybe in our day and time, uh, Christian unity is one of the biggest challenges we face. And uh, don't let it slip by that Satan would like for you and me to focus our energies on some sort of disagreement between ourselves instead of focusing our energy and our attention on the great commission Christ gave to us. Unity in Christ does not require all of us to hold the same opinion, not politically, not socially, not financially, really on how to come in relationship with Christ and that he uh, commands to be Lord, the boss of your life. That's the place where we find our unity. That is our unifying allegiance. That is why we say we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are family. We don't have to agree on church matters, on policy, on procedure, etc., etc., etc. We are people with freedom of choice given to each of us by God. And so here's what I've uh, learned from my short little life. We will disagree. It's just the way it is. It would be easier for me if you would just do what I tell you. <laughs> and it would be easier for you if I would just do what you tell me. I hope I got those right. But that's not God's plan for either or all of us. Apparently, a prerequisite in the scripture in our text this morning uh, for of the same mind is humility. Now, that can go a long way in establishing harmony and unity among fellow Christ followers. Uh, he says, do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Uh, the book of James uh, covers this at chapter 2, and we looked at it with Tom uh, last Wednesday night. Uh, we all have ways, probably unobserved by ourselves, to be prejudiced toward others. Uh, so I guess I want to make sure I, I say this clearly to you, all Lives matter. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Well, you know, the quote, nobody likes to know it all. Uh, but it gets back uh, to this humility thing. We can practice a form of outward humility without having any humility in our heart. So this is a heart condition, and it takes practice. It takes committed practice, confessional practice, maybe we should say, uh, at saying, God, am I being humble in my heart? And is my attitude and my conduct demonstrating that humility? Uh, because we're somewhat self-centered. Uh, we want, I don't know about, I'm sure not you. I want what I want. And um, I have to be reminded that really what I want is for Christ to be Lord in my life. Uh, I found that in ministry, specifically in working with Christ followers, church members, that there is a command in Scripture here at verse 18. And it says, if it is possible, as much depends on you, live peaceably with all men. This is a tall order. And I've served on a few secular boards. And this is even more challenging <coughs> among folks with a specific agenda and do not have this unifying uh, place uh, in their life of Christ first. Um, uh, and sometimes their agenda is somewhat hidden, and sometimes it's just downright overt. It's maybe in your face. This order is one that we often find a way to get around. We say, I've tried, and there's just no way to work with him or her. I, 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 I was going to say I hear that the most, and then I was thinking to myself, no, I say that the most. Uh, and uh, the other thing, well, hey, I've, I'm reading the scripture real carefully here, and it says, if it is possible. And so our answer is, it's just not possible. <laughs> Two wrongs don't. Anyway, as much as depends on you. Another way of saying this is to do everything that you can to get along. If you can't, then try harder. Commit your harder to the Lord and ask him to help you in things that you can't help for yourself. 
I mean, that's why we assemble. That's why we read the book. That's why we know that the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts and leads us in our lives. So I have some summary thoughts I want to give you, and then we'll wind this thing down. Um, I had a game plan, and we're, we're close. Love like God loves you. That word agape. Self-sacrificing, seeking the best for another. God loves you more than you could imagine. Learn about his love for you. Let his love invade your life. Receive his love. That may entail allowing someone else to love you. And as you bask in his love for you, let it overflow into someone else's life. Practice self-sacrificing love. That's neither automatic nor comfortable, uh, but it is doable in Christ and it is gratifying as you live it out. Love your Christ following family as family. Now, you may have used the phrase blood is thicker than water. Okay, it is. I realize that phrase is used to demonstrate the allegiance that we may have for our relatives, our parents, our siblings, uh, maybe even cousins. <clears throat> but we have a blood relationship which supersedes all physical, earthly relationships. Christ's blood is thicker than any association that you may have. He paid it all so that you and I could be sinless before God. We may have disagreements among the family of God. We have Christian denominations to verify the level of disagreements. We have individual churches of the same denomination, even in the same town, to demonstrate that we have differences. But we are of the same family, the family of God. Let's just remember that. And then he says, honor by giving preference to one another. When Janice and I were young adults, we heard about a singing group called the Me Thirds. He said, what's that? And they said, love Christ first, put him first, others second, and me third. Not our world, otherworldly, really, holy, set apart. In my Bible, there's this table. And if I would have been a little quicker... Um, I would have uh, sent this to uh, David or Alexander, but since I'm not quick, I didn't. It's really just an excuse. But anyway, um, my Bible has this table and it says the Christian life at the top of it. And on one side over here, it says description of the Christian. And on this side, it says result. And so the description of the uh, Christian at uh, Romans 12, 1 is that he presents himself to God. And the result is that he becomes a sacrifice that is whole, that is living holy and pleasing to God. In verse 2 of chapter 12, uh, the Christian receives transformation by a renewed mind. And the result is that he discover, he or she discovers and displays the will of God. In uh, Romans 12, 6 through 8, uh, the Christian has spiritual gifts according to grace from God. And the result is that he or she uses spiritual gifts as part of Christ's body in, in uh, verse 6. In uh, 13, uh, 1, and we've had quite a bit of discussion, even uh, in our uh, church council meeting about this, uh, the Christian honors civil law in 13, 1, and he honors God in 13, 1. Um, in 14, 19 of Romans, he pursues peace and he the result is that he serves to edify all. And in 15.5, it says that the Christian becomes like-minded toward others. And the result is that that Christ follower glorifies God with others. The bottom line is verse 21, a little phrase, overcome evil with good. If this is all that we have to say, then it's good admonition, good advice. Maybe even uh, I hope that you've heard commands from Scripture for your and my behavior. But the reality is that try as we might, aspire as we desire, we cannot love as God loved us in our own power. The good news is that not only can we not and that we would not, but for the power of the Holy Spirit living in each of us who calls on the name of Jesus. Um, you're right. Only God can do this. Love others in a self-sacrificing manner. Confess your lack of love, your ability, your inability to love to him. Ask for his Holy Spirit to make 
uh, himself known to you and loving others, those who are unlovable in your view, and I guess uh, the last words I have is that change happens. It can happen in your life today. It can happen right now. And I'm asking that you let it begin now. We're going to sing a, a, a song this morning um, as our closing song and an invitation opportunity for you if you'd like to make any form of decision that includes me. It's uh, Living for Jesus. If you'll stand with me as we sing uh, 545 in your hymnal. Living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please Him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, friends hearted and free, this is the pathway of blessing. a confession I, another confession i make a lot of them to you but uh, i've noticed uh, one thing about me is that i tend to fill available space i don't know is that what we were trying to do becky when you were talking about filler but anyway um and so uh, so here it looks like the only way i can do it is we just stop singing and we pray and, and close so uh it's been good to see each of you today uh continue to encourage one another in your walk with the Lord. Be faithful to Him. Be praying for one another. Truly, um, uh, the only way I can say this uh, for me is continue to ask God to help you pray for your enemies. And um, uh, a man said one time, it's hard to hate a person that you're praying for. And uh, I found some truth to that statement. I'm not sure that the scripture uh, came from scripture, but I believe that there's uh, truth to the observation. So uh, because we have this microphone confusion, I'm going to pray for us and uh, let you go. So let's pray now. Father, we thank you for the day, uh, the beauty of it. Thank you for my family that's here today and our family time together. And uh, uh, Jada and Thomas are part of that family, and so we thank you for them. Um, as um, this day unfolds, help us to uh, see the opportunities that you've given to us to be witnesses for you in whatever it is that you have going on. Uh, thank you for uh, those folks that have and, and are serving at Hesperus Baptist Camp over this uh, last week and this weekend. Thank you for the opportunity for us to uh, continue to resume uh, the things that um, are uh, tenets of our meeting and, and ways that we relate to one another and study your word uh, together in these next few weeks. Um, bless that. Um, just thank you for who you are. Help us uh, as we reflect um, on, but also reflect your love to others around us. Uh, help that to be truly what's taking place, that our relationship with you just expands to knowing that uh, you love those around us and that you have a plan for each of their lives and you have a plan for uh, me in helping uh, meet their needs and uh, work in their life. Thank you again for your great love. Bless our church family. In Jesus' name, amen.